had just turned 16 when I first heard the cursed words, Memnu' al tajawwul spoken by an Israeli soldier announcing curfew. Israel had just invaded the West Bank where I live and imposed a military occupation over it. This was just the start of a way of life that has since dominated my existence, characterized by restrictions on movement and the imposition of a culture of control through an array of permits for almost every aspect of life. And if this were not enough, worse was yet to come. Not long after the occupation began, I became witness to a process whereby the lovely hills of Palestine, where I was fond of hiking, began to vanish and become inaccessible as more and more Jewish settlements were established on them. How was I to meet these huge, huge challenges, resist the injustice, and forge a creative way of life under such restrictive conditions? I had just returned from my law studies in London. It was my belief that having been fortunate enough to get an education, I owed it to my society to give back whatever I can. But how? What role could someone like me, with no political affiliation, play in, a, in the highly politicized atmosphere of Palestinian society? I looked around me and could see that Israel was abusing international law. And yet, throughout the world, the Israeli occupation was largely accepted as one of the most benevolent in history. Not only that, it was also supposed to be bringing economic benefit to the occupied people. Now there was something I could do. With a small group of friends, we worked on establishing the first human rights organization in Palestine, perhaps even in the whole of the Arab world. Its mission was to tell the truth about the Israel's occupation and assess the compatibility of its actions and policies with those of international law of occupation. At that time, human rights NGOs were unheard of. The entire subject of human rights was still foreign to our society. This made our task most unpopular and suspect. We were accused of being CIA, of being in conspiracy with the occupation to distract people from political action, which it was believed was the only legitimate form of struggle. It was unpleasant, to say the least, and an uphill battle, but we persisted. All of us, at first, were doing this enormous and critical work on a voluntary basis. We saw it as our contribution to our society. The organization we established was called al Haq Justice. Those it employed were acquiring a new vocation. But when their friends asked them what work they were doing and they answered human rights, they could not understand what this meant. How can one be a professional human rights activist? Those of you born after the impressive proliferation and popularization of human rights work might find it difficult to appreciate this problem. As the organization grew, established itself, and became the main advocate for Palestinian human rights, it gained international credibility, and the voices of the detractors began to fade. We had succeeded in putting on the map a new kind of organization doing essential work that no one had thought of doing and raising the voice of justice for Palestine throughout the world. From the very beginning, my hope was that I would assist in the establishment of a public institution and then leave. Al Haq was not going to be like many other local institutions dependent on any one person. It would have its own institutional tradition, memory, image, 
and reputation separate and distinct from those who founded or ran it. After 13 years of volunteering as a co-director, it was time for me to leave. El Haq had come of age. I was free to pursue my passion for writing. Throughout the period of my work with El Haq, I had continued with my legal practice, which has and continues to be my main source of income. I never wanted to be economically benefit, getting economic benefit from my work in human rights and wanted to have the freedom to write what I wanted rather than be driven by economic forces. Ever since the occupation began more than 43 years uh, ago, I have been keeping a diary in which I record my feelings and emotions and responses. This is always proven. This is always proven invaluable in helping me understand and come to terms with events taking place around and within me. There never was a dearth of things to record. The emotional impact on our lives from what we endure under occupation is stupendous. As a writer, I'm constantly struggling to find a way of surviving the negative impact of living under occupation. But it is not just that. Any oppression and injustice can engender feelings of stifling hate and profound anger that can grip and paralyze. Many of you who live in our region and those who live in the wider world must have suffered from similar emotions and felt the frustration of not knowing what to do about them. Do we respond by hating in equal measure or do we endure and accept to be diminished by the negative emotions? William Butler Yeats, the famous Irish poet, wrote, too much of a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. I don't know whether you ever had a similar experience. But sometimes when I hear a lovely piece of music or stand before a good work of art, I feel my soul leaving my body and soaring. At such moments, I ask, why can I not pursue beauty in a transformed world free of oppression and petty haggling? Why should I constantly be held back by all the ugliness around me, by the restrictions on movement, the requirements for permits, the heart-wrenching news of the killing and maiming that seems to be constantly taking place all around me? My anger is directed mainly, but not exclusively, at the Jewish settlers who are the cause of much of the suffering, who have come uninvited from other lands to share my space unequally, compromise my happiness and the enjoyment of my country. I then ask, why should I put up with the effect on my life of their anachronistic enterprise that is managing to render my life and the future of all the inhabitants of this land so miserable? and precarious? Why should my life be held hostage to their ungodly scheme? At moments like these, I find myself refusing to submit to that voice calling memnu'a tajawwal or to the political reality that has resulted in the ludicrous fragmentation of this land, which for a long time was free of borders. Then I feel seized with the desire to resist history and pursue a new vision of the land. Let us go together to that very spot where I first had this vision of the land as it one day could become. I was leaving the craggy hills of the Jerusalem wilderness 
just before I reached Jericho, I saw the old sign alerting travelers that they were reaching sea level. For many years, next to this sign, a Bedouin has been offering rides on his camel to tourists, photographing them mounted before the start of their descent to the lowest spot on earth. Just beyond this spot, the road curves and a small window opens between the hills to reveal the first glimpse of the Dead Sea calmly nestled in the lowest part of the Rift Valley. I drove a further three kilometers down this road until I reached the point where the road parted. There, I stopped the car and went out. I was in the midst of what looks like a large trough, bordered on one side by the Moab Mountains and on the other, the Jerusalem Hills, at the lowest of the low points in the Great Rift Valley that stretches all the way from Turkey to Mozambique. Just like a human being, the crust of the earth is subject to so many tensions and stresses that it sometimes breaks. A fault then develops. Blocks slip off the Earth's crust along great ruptures or cracks where rivers and lakes are formed. Faults in the Earth are of long standing, measured by deep time. They can mirror faults in human society that create instability and lead to revolution and change. The Dead Sea south of where I stood that lies in the deepest spot in the Rift Valley produced by this great fault shimmered so peacefully in the fading evening light. I felt a strong desire to follow the fault, traveling through the Great Rift Valley, standing, starting north in the Syrian plains, through Lake Qaraun in Lebanon, and down to the Dead Sea and Lake Tiberias, examining how it developed from geological pressures on the tectonic plates far below the surface of the Earth. The political changes now taking place in the region also have their origin in deep sources of discontent that cause as deep a cleavage as has produced the Great Rift Valley. Just a few months ago, in the volatile Middle East region, all seemed calm, as though nothing would ever change. Then, the eruption happened, first in Tunisia, then in Egypt and other Arab countries. Because the area is below sea level, I was able to breathe the dry air so easily that it made me feel heady. So soothing were the pastel colors, the blue of the sea, the ochre yellow of the fertile soil, and the ever-changing pink hues of the Moab Mountains to the east reflecting the setting sun. I had left behind the conflicted city of Jerusalem in the midst of the central hills of the West Bank with its myriad checkpoints and walls and arrived at the most liberating spot in the region. Here, in this wide Jordan Valley, I could so easily follow with my eyes the meandering depression through which the River Jordan flows. And imagine the whole of this valley as one, a land without borders, where everyone is free to travel and enjoy all the wonderful pleasures it has to offer. As I stood there, I felt I had a momentary respite from the terrible confines of the dismal present. Then the words of the people of Egypt and Tunisia and other Arabs living under oppression came to me loud and strong. The people want freedom. The people want freedom. And I thought, what if more people realized, as I do now, that we all live along this great rift valley in one trough, 
in the most fertile valley, rich with water and minerals and gorgeous views. What if we remembered that only a hundred years ago, all the people in the region lived under one political entity without the present-day fragmentation that is proven so fractitious? What if we returned to where we started from recognizing our separate realities as nations, but without borders, belligerency, and occupation? What if all the people in the various countries in this embattled region cried in one voice, the people want free movement along this great rift valley, no more borders, no more occupation, and no more wars? Thank you.